In this last case study, you are going to learn about this thing called mutual inductance. What happens when you have two coils, such as the layout right here? Now, what does mutual means? Mutual means each other. Inductance, well, induced stuff. What do you mean by mutual inductance? And why are they transformers in this chapter? Are they decepticons as well? No, it's just a name. So remember once at the beginning, we looked at Faraday's original experiment, what he did. Oh, the general idea is something like this. He took a he took an iron core and he wrapped a coil on one side connected to a battery. So yeah, you can make current flow inside here. But he also took another coil and wrapped it on the other side of this iron core. And he noticed magic when he closed the switch and the current started flowing in the first coil. The second coil also showed a reading, like maybe 10. <gasps> but 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 the but the circuits are not linked. The secondary coil is not directly connected to the primary coil. Why is there current in the second coil? You may have guessed it, induced current, induced EMF in the second coil. So that is the whole idea of mutual inductance. There are two coils. They are not connected by a wire, but you can generate uh, induced current in the second coil so that there's also current in the second coil, although it's not connected to a battery. So let's go and see what, how do we, Think about induced current and things like that. So here we have two coils, uh, coil P and coil Q. Now, if I just let them chill here, what's going to happen? Nothing's going to happen. They're just going to continue chill chilling there. So if we want to get things rolling, I'm going to connect the first coil to a power supply, an AC power supply, actually, uh, if I want to. So at the beginning, uh, there is no, no flux change, or I should say, at the beginning, the flux through the second coil is zero. Okay. All is chill. It's initial. Suddenly, I turn on the power supply. Maybe it's AC. Positive, negative. Ooh. So we have current now flowing in this direction. Like that. I'm going to draw a few arrows to show the direction of current. Okay. So where will the magnetic field of the first coil be pointing towards? Going to use your right hand grip rule. And I guess for you guys will be like that. Okay, so I don't know, the camera is kind of flips. So I don't know how to show you. But a right hand grip rule, you will get a magnetic field pointing in this direction. So from left coming out to the right, like that. Zoop. This is a feel of a solenoid. Do you remember from the previous chapter? So this is the feel of P. Why is there a feel? due to a current in P. And those are closely related. Now this field, actually the lines go very long one, like you can go all the way until here. You can draw and draw and draw. So in see, uh, coil Q will be affected by this new field that suddenly appeared. And does the coil like that? Nope. Generally coils uh, do not like, or any kind of enclosed areas, do not like a changing flux. So, when there's suddenly this field pointing to the left, it's going to try to oppose that field. So, how to oppose the field? You don't want a, 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 a field to the left, so what do you do? You give a field to the right. You create your own field to the right to oppose this change that suddenly appeared. So, this call queue will generate or induce a current such that the field will oppose the change. Suddenly appear. Oh, your suddenly the final flux, there's some kind of field pointing to the left thanks to core P, pointing to the left. And you want to oppose that. So you create your own field to the right. So, in other words, this is like saying north and south, okay, because the arrows point out there. And for the purple coil Q, that's kind of saying north and south. So you see, they repel. South and south, they repel each other. So you want to oppose each other. It's like, yeah, why is the nigga field? Go away. So where would the current be flowing in this secondary coil Q? Got to use your right hand grip rule again. Right hand grip rule. And you got to see, okay, thumb is pointing to the right. Means all my fingers will be curling down this way. Which means the current will be flowing down, in and out. This is the current in Q. Okay, so induce EMF, current, yay. Okay, that's good. We have mutual inductance. That's what it's called. So one, so to summarize, 
one coil on the left is called the primary coil and the job of this coil is to generate an alternating field or alternating flux, whatever you want to call it. Alternating B, I'll just call it that. Okay, so alternating or a changing B. Suddenly, suddenly you have a B come out and that field or the flux line stretch over and also affect coil Q. So the purpose or more or less the, the, the role of this secondary coil, let's call this secondary, is to respond to the field and it will have a induced EMF. Why go in this EMF? Due to the change in flux thanks to coil P. Because they affect each other. Okay, so I'm just going to finish labeling up here. This is I of P. Okay, so just remember one coil creates a field, the other one responds by inducing some kind of current. Now, this is called mutual inductance. What if. What if I just maintain this power supply for a long time? What do you think is going to happen? If I just keep this current going in the same direction, eventually there'll be no more change. If there's no change in flux, then there will be no change in, uh, there'll be no EMF induced. So I cannot just keep it constant this way, having a direct current. No, no, I need an alternating current. One moment flow this way, got change in flux, induce. One moment flow that way, got change in flux, induce. Flow change in flux, induce. Change in flux induce. So you could have keep changing, changing, changing a few. So maybe I come down here and I say, oh, uh, what if I now say, okay, let's switch it up. Now I make the right side positive. AC, my okay, I put AC. AC. The symbol is like the Pepsi Cola symbol, but lying down. AC. So one moment, positive, negative. Next moment, negative, positive. Okay, let's do the same thing again. So what's going to happen? Now current flow in a different direction to the right and up. That means you'll come down here. Let's draw a few arrows to remind ourselves. And back. So this current will generate a field. So you're going to draw our flux lines again. So now where is uh, Use your right hand grip rule. Try to see where the fingers curl. Okay, where the fingers curl down, that's going to be the current. So your thumb is pointing to the right. So that would be north here. Oh, I should draw a field first. Nah. North. And since it's a solenoid, something like this. Wow, my lines look great today. What did I eat in the morning? I have no idea. Okay, so we have our solenoid field generated because of a current flowing inside that. And this one's a steady. Well, as long as the current is steady, you have some kind of field. So this is the field of coil P. Flux lines stretch over into coil Q and affect it as well. So coil Q was happily chilling and suddenly, hey, why got field coming in from the left side? What is this? I do not like this change. Oppose! So coil Q says, nope, I do not want any field here going to the right, so I'm going to try to oppose that. So coil Q will generate and be a rebel and says, nope, I'm going to create a field of my own that points to the left to oppose it. Oppose this change. Sudden change here. So it looks something like that. Wow, now the line not so nice already. Okay, okay, like this. Draw one more time. Ah, there we go. So, where's north, where's south? Well, do double check. This is north, this is south. So opposing the change in flux, north and south. Okay, so where's current flowing? Time to use the fingers to check. So your thumb needs to be pointing to the left like that and your fingers will show the direction of where the current is flowing so that will be mm, current flowing see up okay so we draw up this is where the current will be flowing in this coil so that will be coming down here to whatever component voltmeter or what I guess voltmeter won't let current flow up but there's an induced EMF and current Q so there's an EMF Induced. Okay, uh, I forgot to label this one. Oh, that's an EMF induced, and this voltmeter can measure it. Okay, so AC 
will allow you to keep switching back and forth between these two scenarios. Current to the left, suddenly current to the right, current to the left, induce, current to the right. So as long as you keep changing, you can induce current. But your induced current is also changing, 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 changing. Because AC ma, left, right, left, right, induce. So <laughs> it's like induce or pose. Induce, 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 north, north, south, south, north, north, south, south. North, north, south, south. That is what we call mutual inductance. There's always at least two coils and they affect each other and things like that. Now, a few things to add. If you want, if I ask you to draw a graph of the induced EMF and current, how are we going to do that? Pass your questions, do ask about that thing. So let's try draw a graph of this scenario, how the alternating current in the primary coil can induce an alternating EMF in the secondary coil. So I've got me some graphs right here. Let's take a look at how we can start off. Okay, there's actually two axes. One for coil P. Yeah, let's do this here. One for coil Q. So the first one up here, I'm going to say, okay, this is for coil P. Whatever happening in coil P, whatever happening in coil Q will be down below. So this is our primary the one that's generating the field in the first place. And the secondary is the one that's having all the induced EMF and other things like that. Okay, let's begin. So we know that the first coil will have a current that keeps changing direction. An alternating current, AC. That's what AC stands for. Alternating current. So I'm going to say, let's say the alternating current is a sine wave. So I'm going to draw a very nice sine wave. There we go. So this is what I call current of the primary coil, P. So how does that affect coil Q? How does that affect the EMF induced in coil Q or things like that? By the way, this is in time, uh, oscillation in time. So the, the main thing you think of is Faraday's law. How do we know what's the EMF induced? So the EMF induced in primary, in secondary, sorry, EMF in Q, we know that from Faraday's law, that that will be, or oh, that is related to the change in flux. But change in what flux? Oh, so the flux of this purple color actually stretches into the secondary coil. So you could say like this flux of P, eh, flux of P is kind of the same as flux of Q. Which is the same flux lah. The flux just stretches over and wraps into it. Because I didn't draw the whole purple thing. But just know that the flux Q stretches over into that. So the change in flux is the same for both P and Q. That's why I just wrote it here. So that means change in uh, flux, whether P or Q, I don't care which one, will cause an EMF to be induced in the second coil. But I don't know the flux. I only know current. Can I relate current with flux think back a little bit oh wait yes we can do that flux by the way is b times a and for solenoids we know that the b magnetic flux density is related somehow to their current i for example you have a uh, the magnetic flux density inside a solenoid can be measured by b equals to mu naught n i over l and generally, the equation for all these B equations is related to I. So B, so flux is proportional to B, because phi goes to BA. And B is proportional to I. Current. Got current, got field. And it's proportional. Oh, so this graph hall actually can also be the flux graph. Flux BA, okay, things like that. So we can kind of summarize and say, therefore... The EMF induced in the second coil is proportional to the change in rate of change in the primary coil's current. Oh, okay. So this can be I or phi or B. The graph will generally have the same shape like that. They're all related. They're all in phase. Okay. So from there, how are we going to draw the induced EMF? I'm going to label that as a second graph. Uh, induced EMF 
in Q, the secondary coil. Please remember Faraday's law. Induced EMF is proportional to rate of change of flux or rate of change of current, whichever one you want to remember. So we have to look at rate of change. Rate of change means gradient. Oh, okay, okay. So let's look at some points. Maybe I start with... Where shall I start with? Ah, let's start with this point. At that point, what is the... Let's use orange color instead. At that point, what's the gradient? Zero. So at this point, your d phi dt, which is kind of proportional to di dt, is zero. No slope, no gradient. So your induced EMF will be zero. No change in flux. No change in current at that point. There's another one down here, also zero. Okay, no? we put zero here. How about the other places? Let's add the markers of the graph as well. Uh, here, here, and here. Okay, let's see. Where is there a biggest change in flux because of a biggest change in current? Well, this one looks pretty big at the beginning. Look at the slope, so steep. The steepest. So, this is a positive slope. To remember Lenz's law, it is a positive increase, negative induced EMF. Because E proportional to negative uh, rate of change. Mark. So, there will be a negative big gradient there. Hmm. Where else are? Huh? Here, pretty big gradient too, but going down. This is a negative gradient, so I'm going to put a positive induced EMF. Something like that. Last point. Here, another positive gradient, pretty big. So I'm going to put a negative EMF down here. So what is this graph? If you can't recognize the shape, it's actually an upside down cosine graph. Looking something like this. So yeah, that's how you can relate the primary current with the induced EMF in the secondary coil. And make sure you know how to sketch a graph and translate between. Knowing how to think of the gradients is very important. Of course, if you know the equation and you know differentiation, you just differentiate sine, you get... Well, differentiate sine, negative, then you get negative cosine. So note that all this graph, I draw it purposely uh, so you can see how they relate in time for both cases. So the, just remember the rain idea that you must have a changing current in your primary so that there's a changing flux. When there's a changing flux, then only you have induced EMF. So that's why you need an AC. Look at this AC. You must have the AC. Otherwise, uh, if it's just a straight line, there's no change in... There's, there's, the gradient is just zero. You can't have a straight line. You have to be going up and down, up and down. Then you will have a induced EMF that is lagging behind by 90 degrees. Phase difference. What's the phase difference between two, these two graphs? 90 degrees. How do I know? Well, I can kind of check this by picking a reference point. Then let's say this is the beginning of the graph down here. Then on the second graph, it will be somewhere on this part, reference point. So this is called a phase difference of 90 degrees. You don't need to know exactly 90 degrees, but just know that sometimes in past year they will ask you, why is there a, why are they not in phase? Not in phase means got phase difference, or they are shifted. Sine and cosine are always shifted by 90 degrees. So there's a lagging behind. Okay, uh, what else do we need to know? Oh yes, so reminder, you must have AC. Uh. DC cannot work. So I'm going to write a reminder for us somewhere here. So reminder slash warning. Uh, DC cannot give you that alternating or changing flux. So there's no effect on secondary coil which is coil Q because nothing is changing why would you want to induce anything okay so that is how you can think of this whole mutual inductance idea so you'll need to know how to explain this in words or so graphing is a big part of this chapter but also writing and explanation so let's write out the whole process if they ask you to describe what's happening you have to describe the whole the whole process and step that we just talked about so let's go down here and grab a pen and describe the whole process. Why is there an induced EMF in... Why is there a current in the second coil? Why? Faraday sat down and thought hard about it. And he came up with the answer. So, let's explain. Start with number one. So, all answers, explanation can generally follow this structure. First, identify the change in flux. Who's doing the changing flux? First coil. So, we're going to talk about the first coil causing a flux that can change. So, we can say, as the flux... 
I'll say an alternating current in primary coil, which is coil P, causes a changing flux. So why do we have a changing flux and what does it do again? So there's a changing flux in coil P, but the flux actually links both coils. Actually, the flux will go through all the coil, the purple color flux. So we have to say that they are linked. Magnetic flux, linkage. They link all these coils together. Ma. So we can say uh, there's also a change flux in coil, the second one, in coil P, which is a secondary, also changes as they are linked. Linked together, everybody all linked together. So you change, I change. Sometimes we will include a soft iron core, like this core is wrapped around the core. So I just like to put a, a little note here. Sometimes true a soft iron core. We can talk about what a soft iron core is later. Okay, so that's number one. You have a alternating current causes a changing flux. And this flux is in P, it's also in Q. They're all linked together. Important words to talk about how they are linked. Lah. You see this keyword appear in the masking pretty often. Okay, number two, what happens? Ah? So if you have a changing flux, then you need to talk about Faraday's law. Faraday's law is name drop Faraday. So this is talking about Faraday. Point one, change flux. Identify, talk about it. Point two, talk about Faraday's law. So you can say a change of flux uh, induces EMF in the secondary coil Q. Okay, if you got a changing flux, means you have EMF. That is antiphase to coil P. If you're wondering why I use the word antiphase, that's because of Lenz law. So Faraday, then you must also talk about Lenz. So Lenz, why is antiphase there? Oh, to oppose the change. Oops, got a mistake there. Oppose the change. Changes, actually, because they're alternating, changes in flux due to changes of current in P. So actually, we're talking about Faraday in the first part. Faraday's law. Then the opposed change, this is talking about Lenz law in the context of this situation. Right? So yeah, that's the main idea how you can talk about it already, law. I kind of summarized it a little shorter here today. So first one, remember, talk about changing flux. And this flux goes through both coils. So they are linked. That's what I mean by linked. Then a changing flux induces EMF. That's the next part of the story over here. Induces EMF. But also mention, you can also mention uh, Lenz law or post the changes, things like that. There are many ways to talk about this law. You can say coil Q will generate its own orange color field to oppose the change in flux, also can. Okay, that is a general structure, how you can answer this. Go check out some of the examples that will post after this to practice answering questions for different kinds of scenarios. Now, before I end this section, I want to introduce to you different ways where you can see these two coil mutual inductance kind of set up. They may not always be side by side like this. If you notice, uh, I draw, or there's this diagram that has these two lines here. Actually, that's an iron core. Why would you have an iron core? Hmm. Let's take a look. So you could have something like this where you have just coils in the air, you know, coils hanging there. Or you could have something like this where the coils are wrapped around an iron core. Why do we do an iron core? For several reasons. You might want to jot this down somewhere on your piece of paper. Why do we have an iron core sometimes inside all these coils? So reason number one, these are called soft iron cores. I mean, don't need to be soft, lah, but iron core also can. So why do we do that? Reason number one, they make the feel stronger. Like they give the feel more power. But that is not the term you want to say. The term you want to say is that they have high permeability. High permeability. So all these B lines, these flux lines that we draw can actually be much stronger throughout the whole thing. It enhances the feel. 
way stronger. You don't get weak so fast. Okay, high priority. And also it means that these soft iron cores are easily magnetized and demagnetized. So easily magnetized and demagnetized. So when the iron core is chilling inside a magnet, let's say your coil generates a current such that you, the coil itself become north and south. Correct, right? Yeah. Then this iron core will also become magnetized north and south. It becomes a magnet. So the coil is a magnet. The iron core also becomes part of the magnet and makes the magnet very, very strong. Feel is very, very strong. So even though you're very far away, secondary coil can still detect. So that's what we do soft iron core. Lah. Other forms is, they may not be side by side. They could be something like this. Maybe in a circle also can. No? Okay. So these are air cores. And the link, the, the two coils, the two solenoids are coupled because of the magnetic field kind of curl around like that. But sometimes it's not strong enough. So what we do, we put an iron core like this to link together both. So then the flux can really travel very nicely inside this iron core. So if we draw the whole field, it looks like that. So the flux lines are really strong inside the core, enhanced by the core. So you can have side by side layout like this. You can have a circle layout. This is Faraday's initial setups. And actually, they look very cute. Do you have a picture of them here? Ah, there. See? These are called copper-coated donuts. I call them that. It's like donut, right? But copper wound around it. And of course, these things are really tiny. They can be very small, used in your circuits. One common one that you will see actually a lot is the square-shaped one. This square-shaped one, also the same idea. Why do we put iron core again? Oh, to enhance the field, to link both solenoids better, the primary and secondary core. So in this case, the magnetic field is the B. Yeah. So if I draw the full field, it looks something like that. But the iron core will really guide and strengthen these lines inside there. Okay, so that is why there's the different ways you can see things. By the way, this is called a transformer. I know, transformer uses mutual inductance. Two coils wrap around a iron core. Transformer, lo? I don't know why the movie Transformer got the idea from. Maybe this? I don't know. But yeah, different ways to apply it. Make sure you can recognize mutual induction and make sure you know how to describe what is happening. So that's all for this section, mutual inductance. Remember, mutual means there's at least two coils and they're, they're affecting each other. And always ask yourself, what the flux is happening here? Start off with the flux. Is there a changing flux? There's a changing flux. You're going to have induced EMF in the other coil. Okay, so I'll see you in the examples video and also the bonus video where we'll look at how to better explain these things and draw graphs. Very important, different, different scenarios. So that's all for this video. I will see you in the next one.